welcome today in a New York City courtroom after a busy day yesterday where both sides delivered opening statements and the prosecution called its first witness. In their openings, the prosecution and defense painted two very different pictures of the former president, prosecutors describing him as having been involved in years of sordid business dealings. They called Trump a co-conspirator in a plot to cover up sex scandals in a so-called catch and kill plan during the 2016 presidential election. They said Trump's actions amount to criminal conspiracy and cover-up by scheming with his then lawyer, Michael Cohen, and David Pecker, who was the publisher of the National Enquirer at the time and the first witness. The defense depicted Trump as a dignified former president and a family man, and above all, innocent. Oh my. Defense stressing no crime was committed. The prosecution then called Pecker as its first witness. The former chairman and CEO of American Media Incorporated explained his publications had practiced, quote, checkbook journalism, where they paid thousands of dollars for stories. The publications also would purchase stories to prevent them from being published by other outlets and then bury them. Pecker also testified Trump met with him after the 2016 election to thank him for being the campaign's, quote, eyes and ears, scooping up information that could be harmful to Trump and then reporting it back to Michael Cohen. Pecker is expected to resume his testimony later this morning. Let's bring in former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin and former U.S. attorney and MSNBC contributor Chuck Rosenberg. Good morning to you both. It's great to have you with us. Lisa, you're in the overflow uh, room yesterday watching all of this, kind of keeping track of Donald Trump's facial gestures and perhaps nodding off. Um, what was your big takeaway from yesterday, day one? A big takeaway is that this is a crime about falsification of business records. And yet, what the government seems to have the most evidence of is of the underlying conspiracy. What still unknown to me is how they're going to prove Donald Trump's own involvement in the falsification of the business records with which he's been charged. So we heard a lot of previews of the evidence of the construction of the conspiracy, who was involved in it, who will place Donald Trump with the knowledge and intent to commit election-related crimes. What I didn't hear as much about is how Donald Trump then directed the cover-up thereafter. For example, Willie, there is a 2017 Oval Office meeting between Donald Trump and Michael Cohen where the prosecution says they cemented the repayment deal. How are they going to prove that? One, through the testimony of Michael Cohen. But I was looking yesterday to hear how else are they going to prove that? They say they have a photograph of the two gentlemen at that meeting. They also have invoices days afterwards. And then a couple of days after that, the first payment to Michael Cohen. But I was hoping to hear that they have a lot more than that. Somebody who was also at the meeting, who overheard the meeting, who placed some of these documents in front of Donald Trump, heard his comments about it. I didn't hear that yesterday. I'm hoping that we hear prosecutors have a lot more about the back end of the deal as they do, as much as they do about the front end of it. Chuck, what stood out to you yesterday? Yeah, so I agree with Lisa, but I would add one thing. You know, the circumstances also matter. Mm -hmm. We often talk about there being direct evidence, maybe conversations or photographs or emails of a transaction. But circumstances matter too, Willie. If you walk out of your house and there's snow on your front lawn, what do you think happened last night? It snowed. And you may <laughs> not have seen it. And there may be some other explanation for why there's snow on okay. your front lawn. Maybe someone there's put it there. Big gaps here. But it's the likely explanation is that it snowed. And so here, Lisa, and I know you agree because we've talked about yeah. this, there are a bunch of circumstances, the timing, the uh, motivation that show that after these conversations and this conspiracy formed, certain things happened, including the issuance of checks to Michael Cohn under the guise of a retainer agreement and then false uh, en uh, ledger entries that followed. And so you're going to see, I think, over the course of this trial, Willie, uh, direct evidence of the conspiracy and what they agreed to do and circumstantial evidence as well. And a judge will tell the jury at the end of the day, both matter. They're both compelling. You can accept circumstantial or direct evidence uh, in deliberating on your verdict. So Donald Trump is calling on his supporters to protest outside the courthouse in lower Manhattan, where his hush money trial is being held. So far, his base has been a no-show. And as the New York Times puts it, the former president is not getting the circus he wanted. 
The paper reports there were only a handful of Trump supporters outside yesterday morning, and they were outnumbered by the Trump detractors who had signs about his alleged affair with an adult film actress. The former president tried to rally his followers with a long post on his social media site just before 7 yesterday morning. He would post later that the courthouse has completely closed down, which is which it is not, suggesting that the poor turnout was a plot against his supporters. Yeah. I actually, um, I'm going to go to Sam, but uh, you first, Joe. I mean, I know that there's going to be this hearing before court resumes today about the gag order. And I just wonder, I mean, Donald Trump wants to be careful about asking people to come and rally. And I mean, the last time... He was pushing people to show up somewhere. There was an insurrection on the Capitol, and he was saying, I'll meet you there. I just don't think he should be telling. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but it seems to me that he might want to just go to court. Well, that's who he is, though. And not ask after, people to show up in his defense. Sam, after he was inaugurated as president of the United States, you could go in the White House for the next week, and usually when you're outside the press room, you can see all these different pictures. President with a young child, president with Marine <laughs> saluting, president with this, president with that. Donald Trump put up pictures of the crowd from angles that made it look like he had more people at his inauguration uh, he than, likes, than yeah. he actually did. So he's sort of obsessed with this stuff. I will say he told them to congregate peacefully. Uh, maybe that's where uh, the misstep was for Donald Trump because nobody showed up. <laughs> and so it's maddening to him. Everything seems to be going against him. He's having to sit in this courtroom. I thought it was fascinating last night on Fox News. You actually had Fox Ho News hosts complaining that he was too old. He was a 77-year-old man. Who would make a 77-year-old man sit, all sit day. down all day? That's what a lot of 77 year old men do. They sit down all day. <laughs> they watch the Atlanta Braves. I know. My dad was one of them. But a lot of people sit down all day. But but he's just going crazy. And to add an insult to injury, of course, he's being outnumbered by people that are having, you know, uh, his, his supporters are being outnumbered by people that are holding up signs talking about porn stars and time in prison. Yeah, I mean, you, he doesn't have Sean Spicer this time to go out there and tell everyone that it's the biggest crowd ever to witness a, a court case, right? Uh, and we can see it with our own eyes and ears. Uh, there are not that many people out there. Some of it may have to do with the fact that it's taking place in uh, New York City. Uh, there are not that many Trump supporters who are there. Some of it may have to do with the fact that the last time he urged people to congregate on his behalf was... January 6 and yep. certainly we know how that ended up and certainly a lot of people have been arrested uh, for their decision to descend on the Capitol uh, but I still can't quite get around the fact and maybe Lisa could address this which is the the, the act of encouraging uh, a protest at the courthouse uh, of asking your supporters to make a spectacle uh, of the court proceedings um, to a degree, uh, maybe not in, in legal terms, but to a degree, it seems like an act of uh, attempted intimidation. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if that's mm. permeated the courthouse at all, if the, if the judge is aware of this, if, if there are uh, ramifications or implications for Trump for doing things like this. I think, Sam, that those implications or ramifications sort of pale in comparison to the alleged violations of the gag order that we're going to deal with this morning at 9.30. The DA has brought to the judge's attention at least 10 different instances that they say are Trump's statements that violate this gag order. Many of them are the same statement with respect to Michael Cohen, but there's also a statement with respect to the jurors themselves, and in particular, a quotation from a Fox News host about Democratic activists trying to infiltrate this jury to throw it against Donald Trump. That's quite an accusation, putting aside the existence of the gag order, but given the wording of the gag order, even worse. And one thing I want to bring to your and our viewers' attention is that in asking for this hearing, they have asked for $1,000 per violation and they've asked the judge to award what is just and proper in addition. That matters because under the criminal contempt statute in New York, you only have two options. You can either find someone $1,000 per violation 
or you can put them in jail for up to 30 days. And so in asking the judge to take additional measures to the extent he finds them just and proper, that's the DA very subtly saying to him, and if you think this guy deserves a slammer, now's the time it's in your court. You know, mm. Caddy K, I, I don't want to run too far afield, but I promise we will get back to this point quickly. But I remember in 2016, opinion page editors had to cut down on the quotes uh, about that columnists would want uh, to, to bring into their columns from William Butler Yeats, The Second Coming, uh, and, and apply it to Donald Trump. And especially... Especially the line that the best lack all conviction while the worst are full of passionate intensity. And that was, it seemed, very applicable in 2016. But I, I actually thought about those lines when I, when I saw Trump whining about the fact that basically nobody cares anymore. This isn't even Elvis 77. It's like the tour bus has rolled on and people just don't care. I don't see the intensity, but I will tell you, I see a lot of exhaustion from people who voted for Donald Trump in 2016. Yeah, look, you see that reflected on the streets of Manhattan. You see it reflected in all of the polls that show us that there's a phenomenal lack of interest in this election writ large. What are we, the NBC polls seem to show that the least interest in 20 years. Um, I don't think this is going to be another situation where Donald Trump drives out massive turnout like he did in 2016, like he did against him in 2018, like he did in 2020. I mean, that's been the argument of the Trump campaign all along is whether you love him or you hate him, Trump drives people to the polls and manages to find new voters to come to the polls, which is how he squeaked out his, his win in 2016. Well, if that's the model that they're looking at in 2024, it just doesn't seem to be there. They're, you know, they're, we look with our eyes, we hear it from our, from our friends, we talk to people who say they're exhausted. I don't know anyone that isn't already exhausted and we ha still have another six months to go of this election and we still have another however many s six weeks or so of this court hearing to report on. But um, Chuck, let me ask a question to you about the prosecution's strategy as you saw it laid out yesterday. And there does seem to be this focus on election interference, so this, the, the, the election interference is behind this, and yet that's not actually what Trump is charged with in this case, unlike in Georgia or January the 6th, um, or, the, or the documents. It's not those cases are election related. Is that is that a risky strategy for the prosecution to try and throw that in there? And will it complicate things for the jurors? I think, Caddy, it helps explain things if done properly. Right. You're absolutely right that Mr. Trump isn't charged with election interference. He's charged with the falsification of records. But there's a context to this. There's a story to this. And it's a logical one. And it's a linear one. And the government is trying to tell it chronologically. The reason that you end up with falsified records is because there was a plot, a conspiracy, a scheme to try and suppress uh, what Stormy Daniels and perhaps Karen McDougal and others had to say about their liaisons with Mr. Trump. And that set off a chain of events, including payments to Michael Cohen disguised as retainers, when in fact he was really just a pass through to get money to these women to keep them quiet. And so in the context of a trial, and I think context matters, you want to tell a jury why it happened. You don't have to prove motive, but if you can prove motive, it makes it a much more powerful case. Look, to your question about whether or not this is risky, trials are always risky. The government has a huge burden. They have to prove their case by proof beyond a reasonable doubt to a unanimous jury. So there's always some risk. But if you can explain why things happen, and tell it in a chronological fashion, I actually think that makes a more, a more compelling story for a jury, one that it's easier for them to latch onto and to follow. So, Lisa, to that point, we've said in the lead up to this trial that this is, of course, a hush money case, but it's also an election interference case. That's not really what the, the prosecution is arguing, is it? And in fact, the defense has said this is not election interference quieting people who might hurt your campaign. He said, this is Todd Blanche saying, that's democracy, his words, not mine. So is this a case primarily or 
exclusively about hush money and not election interference. No, it's a case I would I would venture the opposite. It's a case primarily about election interference because but for that conspiracy, you don't have felony charges. So the statute in New York that prohibits falsification of business records, those are misdemeanor crimes unless you do it with an intent to commit or conceal another crime. And that's where the election interference comes in. But for the intent to either commit or conceal this conspiracy to throw the election, these would not be felony charges. And so they have to tether the hush money payments and the conspiracy to silence these women and the cover up. That all has to be tethered to an effort to change the outcome of the 2016 election. They don't have to prove that it actually did so. In fact, the prosecution said, mm -hmm. we will never know whether this made the difference. But at the end of the day, their line was, this is about election fraud, pure and simple. MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin and former U.S. Attorney Chuck Rosenberg, thank you both. We'll be seeing a lot of you again soon. And still ahead on Morning Joe, President Biden is heading to Florida today to put the spotlight on abortion rights. We'll have a preview of that trip and talk about the split screen of Biden campaigning while Donald Trump is sitting in a courtroom. Plus, colleges and universities across the country are struggling to contain pro-Palestinian protests. We'll show you what some of our President Biden travels to Florida today to deliver remarks highlighting efforts by Democrats to safeguard abortion access and casting former President Donald Trump as a threat to reproductive rights. The president will forcefully advocate for reproductive freedom and call out Donald Trump's abortion bans, as he's been doing since Roe was overturned, according to a campaign spokesman. The Biden campaign has been emphasizing what it sees as a potential path to victory in the state that was captured by Trump in both 2016 and 2020. Biden's visit comes days before a six-week abortion ban in the state takes effect. And an unpopular ban. Let's bring in right now CEO of the Messina Group, Jim Messina. He served as White House Deputy Chief of Staff to President Obama. And around his 2012 re-election campaign, you know, Jim, um, it's very easy to look at Florida and say it's out of reach. If you look at all the Republicans that have moved to the state, uh, you know, look at the, the, it's the, Trump the country. roles, uh, the numbers have really gone up. Uh, that being said, uh, we always have to remember uh, Andy Bashir uh, won the state of Kentucky, a pro-choice referendum, won the state of Kentucky. Andy Bashir won, I think, in part because of an extraordinary ad of a young woman who was raped and was forced to carry uh, her child to term. Um, I'm, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are about Joe Biden going to Florida. Is he wasting his time? No, I don't think so. And in part, you know, I will never try to lecture Joe Scarborough about Florida, but, you know, <laughs> when you look at it, it really is about a national issue. And he's driving this across the country. Barnacle and I were just talking backstage about this is the issue that Joe Biden needs to continue to drive down and tell the kind of stories that Bashir told, have those people out with him talking about why this is so important. And that will drive these numbers across the battleground states. When you look at the contrast, when you run campaign you want contrasts and the contrast between Donald Trump sitting in a courtroom every day saying crazy things and Joe Biden talking about this unbelievable effort to take away your fundamental rights. That's not just a Florida issue. That's in all seven battleground states. We'll see whether right. Florida is a battleground state in 197 days, but it doesn't really matter. You want the contrast and Florida is a great place to do it as their Supreme Court looks at another one of these crazy six week bans. You know, a couple months ago, we were talking about bedwetters in the Democratic Party. Even during that time, the Biden White House was like yawning. It's like, eh, whatever. We've got a theory of the case. It's going to work out. You look at the trends of recent polls, it seems like they may have been on to something. Here's the latest Marist College poll. Mm -hmm. It follows up on an NBC News poll that actually shows that when you put Robert Kennedy Jr., Cornell West, and Jill Stein in, Biden leads. In this case, Biden up by five points over Donald Trump. And uh, it's within the margin of error, uh, but it's up uh, from the two-point lead Biden held uh, earlier this month. And again, what I always say is uh, this early, it's not about the bottom line, it's about trend lines. Talk That's about right. the trend lines you've been seeing. 
Yeah, look, in the 23 polls in the past month, Biden leads in 10, Trump leads in eight, and five are tied. You know, when you go to D.C., you think that there's panic in the streets of D.C. because Democrats are like, oh, my God, <laughs> the polls are terrible. It's like, no, look at the trend lines. Look at how things are getting better. And that's what you really want to see right now. You want to see the numbers continue to move, and you want to see who RFK is taking votes from. Because when you look at the models, the thing you can't figure out why I don't really trust the polls is who the third party's taken votes from. And to Joe's point, now it looks like he's taken more votes from Trump, which makes sense. It's unlikely that Democrats are going to want to vote for an anti-choice, anti-vaxxer uh, in the middle of this. It makes sense that there would be more Trump voters that would look at RFK than Biden voters. But those are the trend lines we're going to be watching for the next 198 days. Jim, you've always been bullish while people, others have been wetting the political bed over the course of this campaign with the release of every new swing state poll. Um, and the theory of the case, as Joe said, has been, we're gonna go out into these states, we're gonna rail against these, these abortion laws. Yep. We're gonna talk about the economic data being strong while we still need to drive down inflation. He's gonna go out and talk about the things he's done as president while Donald Trump is sitting in a courtroom and you're reminded that he allegedly paid off a porn star after having an affair with her, interfered with an election, took classified documents back. Is that what what we're watching finally right now? Is this what the Biden campaign's been talking about all yes. along? Yes, yeah, the Biden campaign and the Biden political team is probably the most underrated team around. Lots of people want to give them grief, but they've had a theory of the case and the case is starting to work. And you know, the contrast, we talk about contrast. In political campaigns, you have to have the contrast and there's no better contrast to the president doing his job and Donald Trump sitting in a courthouse every day saying crazy things. Because part of the problem has been voters forgot about the bad Trump, the Trump they didn't like because they didn't see him, right? For two years, like, they don't, they're not on true social. They don't see the crazy things he's saying every day. Well, Willie, now they're starting to, and they're starting to say, oh, that's the guy I didn't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah, You know, uh, Sam mm -hmm. Stein, it's interesting, and, and I'll have you go to Jim next, but it's very interesting how these cases have lined up. I think like a lot of legal people, uh, I'm not saying I'm a legal person, but I listen to them. They come on my <laughs> show. I take copious notes. I think this Manhattan case is the weakest of the cases, by far. I would have never brought it. I think it's the weakest case. I think the strongest case is the documents case. But the way things are lined up, um, and again, it's just the way things are lined up. There's no, Joe Biden has nothing to do with any of this. Uh, though those walking through the fevered swamps of other networks uh, say he does. But this is, I think, the weakest legal case. But politically, it's probably the strongest case because politically, this is something people can put their arms around. Hush money payments, <laughs> porn stars, Michael Cohen. You've got all of this yeah. chaos going on. And for the people that, when I was saying they're exhausted, for the people who are exhausted, you know, they're not going to be following this day in, day out, but they're going to look up and they're going to go, oh, that guy. Maybe I'll just not vote or maybe I'll vote for RFK. I mean, it is, again, I think it's a weak case legally. I think politically, though, it would be the last case he would want to start with. Uh, you're saying you would rather not be in a hush money uh, trial with a, uh, involving an affair with a porn star in your presidential campaign? Yeah, I think that's... If I were uh, running yeah. for president, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. I would rather you know, argue <laughs> about the Presidential <laughs> Records Act, even though, even though I yeah. think he's guilty of that one. <laughs> Well, I, you know, yes, I, I do agree. I, I think the one kind of weird caveat here is, you know, we went through this in 2016, not obviously the specifics, but the Access Hollywood tape is what comes to mind, right? It's like in that moment, everyone was just like the bottom had fallen out. This was done. Uh, and we just obviously didn't know what we didn't know. And people rallied behind Trump enough Enough people ride behind Trump, and enough people were uh, disaffected with Hillary Clinton that it worked for him. I don't think this is a historical parallel. I think, to a degree, uh, you are absolutely right. Uh, there is no, there, there's not a con. This contrast does not work for Trump. Uh, it doesn't work in two degrees. One is that it, it reminds people of the of the chaos of the of the show that surrounds him, and Biden, for all his flaws, gets to go out there and do 
traditional, generic political speeches, which helps with the contrast that he wants to create. The second thing is that it ties Trump up in a courthouse uh, at a time when he needs to be doing a few things. One is campaigning, but the other is really raising money. Uh, he, he's got a real cash disadvantage. And, and I guess this is what I would ask Jim about. It's like, you know, money is the biggest currency uh, on campaigns, but currency, little currency, also matters. And, and how does this just affect the campaign itself from the inability to have a candidate get out on the road, do these events? He's tied in New York for four days a week. He can do radio interviews. He can do something on Wednesday and the weekends. But that logistically has to be extremely difficult, right? It is, Sam. The one thing you can't go get more of in a campaign is time. You can go get more money, yeah. you can get a new message, you can do lots of things, but you cannot go get more time. And, and he knows that. That's why he's lashing out. He's sitting in this courtroom day after day while his opponent is out there on the hustings talking to voters. And so that, that waste of time, we only have 198 days here. And every day he's sitting in the courthouse, that's the contrast. You and Joe said the, the magic Word, which is the word chaos. Voters look mm -hmm. at this chaos and say, do we really want four more years of this every day, this kind of thing? It's not really about porn stars or hush money. It really is about reminding voters of the chaos that was the Trump four years and why they don't want it again. And that's the contrast that is driving Donald Trump crazy. Jim, I want to underline something you just said, and and which speaks to why Donald Trump is is you know, going crazy sitting in that courtroom. And it's something that I felt even when I was running in a little congressional race, one of 435, I would look at the calendar um, 18 months out and I go, oh my God, I don't have enough time. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough time. I have all of these, doesn't matter how small the race is, uh, how big the race is. Uh, well, obviously if you're running for president, it, it matters a lot. But that resource, that precious resource time, don't care what race you're running in, you never have enough time. If you're Donald Trump or if you're running Donald Trump's campaign, what do you do? So fast, 95% Democrats, uh, the area is all, mostly all Democrat. You think of it as a just a purely Democrat area. It's a very unfair situation. Donald Trump may have violated the gag order in his hush money trial yet again yesterday during a radio interview complaining about the jury. We'll get expert legal analysis on that and yesterday's opening statements and first witness. Plus, we'll go through the newly unsealed transcripts in the classified documents case, which shows a former White House staffer tried to warn Trump about the legal issues he could face, you know, if he stole classified documents. And it's another day where Trump is in court and President Biden is on the campaign trail, this time in Trump's home state. We'll preview the president's speech in Tampa, Florida. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. It's Tuesday. April 23rd. Along with Joe Willie and me, we have U.S. Special Correspondent for BBC News, Caddy Kay, and Deputy Managing Editor for Politics at Politico, Sam Stein, doing a little way too early duty. Of for course us this he morning. is. Of course he's he is. He's the great <laughs> Sam Stein. He is, he is the great, the legendary okay. Sam Stein. Also, Thank you guys. Appreciate very excited, Sam Finally. Stein, because despite the fact that we are fielding a double A team, uh, <laughs> Red Sox are. Doing pretty well right now. But, better record uh, than the Dodgers. Better record than the Dodgers. Exactly. Exactly. And it matters more now because it's April. But anyway, um, okay. Willie. Um, Just go to Willie for the top story. Really. <laughs> because Trust the Red me. Sox did not play last night. Mika and I got to how many episodes? Did we oh, my say? God. We binged. We binged. We saw a four, show. maybe. It's um, called Palm Royale oh, yeah. with Kristen Oh, yeah, Kristen, Kristen Wiig. So good. Incredible. It's Wait, you so guys, good. so good. So, it's so Willie, so you. She's so talented. You, oh, she's amazing. She's Has amazing. Jenny's Willie, you interviewed. Inter inter oh, my oh, God. Oh, my Lord. When she goes, you failed. You, so, you failed. <laughs> you interviewed Willie. Yeah. Carol Burnett, the yes, legend of all legends. And, and I never thought I would say this, but there was a scene. Where Kristen Wiig and Carol Burnett were going back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> Carol Burnett can't talk. She's just going, yeah. and Mika and I looked at each other 
And I was like, oh my God. Like, yeah. she she can go. They're spirit animals. They're spirit animals. She yeah. can go like yeah. toe to toe with one of the greatest of all time. And it was just such a pleasure to, to, to watch. And in fact, the whole set, the whole crew, everything, it was amazing. Yeah, it is such a beautiful, splashy show. It's Palm Beach in 1969. The sets, the houses, the costumes, snooty people hanging out Fabulous. at country clubs trying to crack into society. It's amazing. And yeah, Carol <laughs> Burnett, I guess we shouldn't give too much away, but let's just say she starts the series in a coma, which when I interviewed her, she said it was the best gig she ever had. She'd go to hair and makeup and then just lie there and go to sleep all day, and she got a check at the end of it. Um, I, yeah, we won't give away too much, but she and Kristen it's too good. are incredible together, oh. and the entire cast. And, and it's just Martin. like I said, it looks good, too. It's a great show. Yep. Yeah. I mean, there's so many great actors in here, but yeah, and at one point, uh, Carol Burnett, while she's not talking to us, she goes, oh. I mean, it, nice little throwback, but uh, but yeah, Caddy K, you you obviously have, have seen it. It is, I would just say, uh, one or two snooty reviews uh, saying, oh, well, this couldn't happen, that couldn't happen. They don't know Palm Beach. Yeah, I, really. I, I thought it was a pretty extraordinary send up of Palm Beach. Yeah, I, first of all, the fashion. Amazing. God, mm. I wish we still dressed Fabulous. like they did. All the Me bit too. parts, yeah. the husband, the pool boy, the guys that come into it are great. And I love the way you start to realize that, you know, for all of the glamour and the glitz, it's all about secrets. Everybody has secrets, and they're all trying to be somebody they are not actually. And that's what I think that's what's so genius about it. You're right. I, I completely binge watched it, and I'm waiting now for it. It comes out ah. on Wednesdays. I wait yes. for Wednesday. Yeah. We are waiting it's for, sad. Waiting for Wednesday. Waiting. That's my you life. Have the day waiting for Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Of course, jo Josh Lucas was on earlier. No, I know. And, I know. Uh, we have to it's get more great. of them on. No, we need, mm. okay. we need to collect all. This was a nice seven. break from uh, <laughs> Donald was, was Trump was in court. Donald Trump in court. Donald Trump in court. But will a Donald Trump was yeah. in court again yesterday, and I think he fell asleep again. I think he did too. Three more quick shout outs Laura Dern, Allison Janney, oh. and Ricky Martin. Incredible. Yes, Ricky oh, Martin come on. is I, incredible in, in this show. All three of them. Yes. Yes. All, yes. I mean, all three of them just great. And uh, Brewster, I mean, we could go. Go down the list. I, I will say they're all extraordinary. I will say that Meek and I turned to each other. And I mean, I've always, I just loved Kristen Wiig. I just, she's <laughs> yeah. an extraordinary, she's extraordinary on SNL, extraordinary in whatever she does. But we looked at each other after it was over and we said, No, she's that's next, next level. level. Yeah. yeah. She has gone next yes. level. This is. It, yeah, extraordinary. She has taken it to the next level. Palm Royale, check it out if you haven't seen it yet. So, speaking of South Florida, Donald Trump lives there. I don't know. I was trying to make a segue. It yeah, didn't work. Segue. Let's try again. Yeah. Donald by Trump. By the way, Willie, there was a, there was a <laughs> reference like or two, mom, by mom, the way. Mom, mom, there was a <laughs> reference or two at one point <laughs> when Allison Jaddy says, she looks oh, at yeah. the mobster husband and she says, this is where we're going. <laughs> this is where common criminals. Yes. This is where we're They're going in the future place. in Palm Beach. It was good. Yeah. So there's your segue. They're going to run this place. <laughs> yeah. Right, so here's the segue.